This is Wizards, Warriors, and Words, a fantasy writing advice podcast. If you'd like to unlock bonus content and also help the show, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Simply go to patreon.com forward slash Wizards, Warriors, Words to learn more. You can also find this link in the show notes. And a huge thank you to all our current Patreons. You're awesome. Hello and welcome to Wizards, Warriors and Words, a fantasy writing advice podcast. My name's Jed Hearn, author of The Thunder Heist, and I'm joined by my uh, one co-host today, starting with Rob. Uh, hi, I'm Rob Hayes. I'm tired. <laughs> and he's also the author of Pawn's Gambit, which I'm about 70% through, and it's excellent. Um, and today we are joined by a special guest, M.L. Spencer. Melinda, thank Hello. you for joining the show. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Melinda Spencer, um, writer with the name ML Spencer. Nice to meet you. Fantastic. And uh, today we're going to be talking about all things marketing, um, because I, I think that uh, Melinda does a really excellent job of this. Um, having looked at her website before the show, it's amazing. Um, has like, yeah, really evocative fantasy styling to it. Her books uh, have incredible covers, really great presentation. So when it comes to marketing, um, just to start things off, I'm curious, when do you sort of start thinking about marketing for your books? Is it after you've written the first draft? Is it while you're writing the first draft? Or is it even before you start putting the first words down? You want to go, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> go on then. Um, I mean, to be honest, it's, it's something that I probably should think of myself a little bit um, beforehand. But uh, I tend to, well, once I've sort of, the book's ready to go and then I'm like okay now I need to get a cover done which usually means you know now I need to get Felix to do a cover for me um mm -hmm. that, that's that's sort of the first time I really start thinking about marketing because for me that's the first time I feel like I need to because you know you need to make sure that the the cover is marketable that, that works in the current um climate and everything so I think that's the first time that I I sit down and go, right, okay, how am I going to market this book? Awesome. What about you, Melinda? I start probably a little bit earlier than that. Well, I'm sure Rob does this too, but I mean, I think of myself as a brand and I'm sure that Rob sees himself as a brand too. I mean, he's not human. Look at him. No, he's a brand. <laughs> <laughs> See, exactly. And that's the it's brand. The hair, the beard, the hat, it's all part of the brand. He just looks like a Viking that was transplanted from the... 10th century into modern times. So yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> I'll take it. I need a few more tattoos, but I'm almost there. <laughs> I even think your beagle might be part of your brand there, Rob. I think, probably, well, she probably is these days because uh, I post about her enough. <laughs> We've had a core on a couple of podcast episodes as well, actually. So <laughs> she is definitely well part of the brand. It's a bit late for her at the moment. She won't make an appearance. Uh, it gets to sort of 10 o'clock at night and she's just like, gone. She's letting the team down, Rob. She, I, look, I think we're going to have to fire her. She's just not pulling her weight on this podcast. And uh, yeah, hasn't delivered what she promised. Um, sorry, <laughs> totally sidetracked. Back to what you were saying, Melinda. Eagle, you were saying man, you, come on! <laughs> you Actually, kind of, let's run with Cora for a while. Okay. Cora has done a lot with for Rob. Um, it's brought him tons of attention. Um, all he has to do is put a picture of Cora up and all of a sudden the entire internet kind of gravitates into the Rob hemisphere. <laughs> true, it's true. People love a picture of a dog, so exactly. I mean, it may not necessarily directly lead to sales but it, it, it you know you post a picture on social media of a, a dog you get a bunch of likes suddenly like if you post it on twitter you get retweets or whatever and suddenly you're being men uh, mentioned in other places and you're getting other people knowing about you and all sorts and it all just kind of adds up and helps i always knew you didn't get a dog just because you love having a dog it was really a nefarious <laughs> marketing strategy all along absolutely the the dog the beard it's all part of the marketing strategy don't forget the jogging the jogging Oh yes, <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. I tell you what, if I, if I say that's part of my marketing strategy, then it it, it makes it feel a bit like less hard work. <laughs> Every kilometer run is an extra book sold. <laughs> oh god, that would be nice. <laughs> That'd be pretty solid. Um, so, Melinda, you you think about things more in terms of like your overall brand. So, what would you kind of describe your overall brand as? It's a big question, but. Um, well, that's, that's actually a really good question. I, I've rebranded myself in the last year. I used to be more of a grimdark author. 
And um, a good example was like my like little Facebook fan group was called ML Spencer's like Dark Empire. So I, I rebranded it. It's now ML Spencer's Epic Empire. Um, I've changed over the whole website, tried to like make it more epic and less kind of dark. Um, I've tried to just, you know, make my whole image like a little bit more, you know, user friendly. <laughs> <laughs> A little, little less of like the, the dark, dark person. So yeah, um, I, I started doing that probably before I even started writing the book because I knew I was going to kind of start going in that direction. And that's when I started rebranding everything. And that book you're talking about is Dragon Mage? Oh yeah, <laughs> Dragon Mage. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. Um, that's interesting uh, because yeah, like definitely, you know, reading reviews of, of Ren Wars or even like the chaos cycle, you know, people do mention the word grimdark a lot. Why did you sort of have that interest in transitioning into more, I suppose, classic epic fantasy territory? Uh, A couple things. Uh, I think the first one is that sales really dropped off and I started really kind of thinking about it and I saw sales dropping off on a lot of the grimdark. I'm thinking, well, maybe grimdark has had its day. Maybe life is a little too dark right now for grimdark and people want something a little bit lighter and happier. And honestly, um, when the whole COVID thing kind of happened last year, I needed something lighter and happier. Um, I needed out of that kind of headspace. And so that's when I started really seriously considering just bailing on the <laughs> the grimdark mid-series and going, okay, I'm going to take a break, swerve into epic fantasy. So that's what I did. Interesting. When yeah, you say I, that, I'm on like page 120 of uh, Dragon Mage and it's, it's getting pretty dark at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can highly left it behind. <laughs> It is always a worry when you're like, oh, this story is just really light and happy and fluffy. And then you're like, uh, Fletcher, that is beyond redemption where people are dying every five pages. What are you talking about? And he's like, no, it's a rom-com. <laughs> come on, guys. Um, well, it is. I mean, to be honest, in, in Beyond Redemption, they just come back to life anyway. Ah, there you go. Spoilers. <laughs> um, that's an interesting transition. What kind of uh, like research or things did you look into to kind of make, oh, hang on, Dirk's coming into the waiting room. Um Hold on. Sorry, I'll just pause this for a second. <clears throat> so uh, I'll just let him in. Sorry, listeners slash watchers, we might have a few minutes while we get, get him on. Surely you can edit this whole section out with your wizardry. Hey, Dirk, we're about midway through an episode just to let you know. So uh, can you hear us? I can hear you. Fantastic. Um, Did I just jump in mid, mid-show? mid Yes. You're our special guest arrival People didn't think you were I was having to hold up everything all on my own. Jed was no help. That's right. Well, I, I bet, was just a burden to this. I bet um, Melinda was doing all the work. She was knowing actually. You, yeah. Knowing you clowns, you slackers. <laughs> <laughs> yep, pretty much. Um, yeah, anyway, this is a nice twist. Uh, this is Dirk Ashton, our other co-host, author of the Paterna series. Uh, Dirk, we're talking about marketing stuff. Um so yeah, I'll, I guess I'll get back into the question I was just asking, but Melinda was just talking about how she sort of transitioned from grimdark fantasy into more sort of classical urban fantasy. Um, epic. Uh, well, yeah, sorry. Epic fantasy. Why did I say urban? Oh, it's because I was thinking it's about just arrived. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. I was so. thinking about a dragon mage going, um. <laughs> yes, we're talking about dragon mage. So yeah, talking about that sort of transition between Ren Wars and Chaos Cycle into um, drag mage, which yeah, is sort of still fantasy. It's a different type of fantasy. Um, so yeah, Melinda, what kind of resources or, or research did you sort of do, um, like in terms of figuring out, you know, how to, how to package a more epic fantasy book, how to rebrand, were you looking at other epic fantasy authors? Um, what was kind of the inspiration set? Um, I did. I did like this huge, like kind of cruise through epic fantasy, looking at a whole bunch of different epic fantasy that's been successful. I kind of like combed through all their reviews on Amazon and try to figure out like what was really working for them that the, you know, the readers were really shouting out about. Um, when it came in terms for, you know, making the cover, I kind of really like um, researched all the covers that were kind of in exactly the novels that I thought mine was kind of like and what was working and stuff. And that's what I kind of gave to my cover artist. Awesome. Yeah. Cause the cover does like, it really does scream fantasy in the best way possible. Um, if you're not, if you're listening <laughs> yeah, to this and not watching on YouTube, the cover has like, yeah, this awesome dragon on it. And then like a cloaked figure with a sword standing on a mountain 
and it looks looks epic. Oh my uh, god! And, <laughs> and it's huge. <laughs> it's gigantic. This book is enormous. How many pages? We embarrass authors. We get them on the uh, podcast, and they're like, "We've got your book." <laughs> yeah, it's just as it's just as gorgeous inside too. You know. Yeah, that it's, looks incredible. The hardbacks yeah, are amazing. If you are debating which version of the book to get, you know, really, paperback, really either, nice. I do recommend the hardback because you could kill a zombie with it. It is that oh. heavy. Yeah. Oh, it's massive. <laughs> yeah, it massive. looks magnificent. Um, that's inter- That's interesting that you had such an analytical process that went into sort of, yeah, I guess packaging it and everything. That really appeals to me. I think I'm like a very numbers driven person. How long did that sort of last for in terms of researching you know, all the other epic fantasy uh, comp titles and everything? Um, a few months, actually. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I spent a while and just kind of, I, I, I read a bunch of books too. I, I, I took a, a bunch of books that had like a lot of really good reviews and stuff like that. And I just kind of cruised through them and just made note, like what's working for them, what's not working for them, what did readers like, what did readers not like, stuff like that. Was there anything surprising that came out of that process? Like, did you have expectations of the genre that, maybe like were changed after doing that research? I was just surprised at how much you've really got to hit the tropes for people. You know, Mm. you you would think that people would see a trope and eventually they would get sick of it. No, (laughs) they want the tropes, you know? And I'm like, okay, how many tropes can we pack into one novel? Well, there we go. I think the only thing I'm missing is elves, maybe. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yeah, but you do have some, you do have some characters that are very similar to elves. (laughs) <laughs> they could easily you know it's interesting though because like you you do you read like some reviews or or some sort of the more critical reviews and a lot of them if, if they'll find if they'll find tropes in a book they go oh it's very tropey or there's just too many tropes or whatever but then yeah you you sort of like if you engage with with the majority of readers yeah they, they do tend to like tropes um yep. and i think it's partly because people like the familiar a trope is familiar it yes. you know it's uh it's almost pre-packaged and it makes people feel a certain way. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah. Trope is, trope is one of those words that gets thrown around, you know, in fantasy, a dude with a sword is a trope. So if you really don't like tropes, don't read anything with a dude or a woman with a sword, because that's going to be fantasy. <laughs> Yeah, I think the thing with tropes is like there's nothing inherently wrong or bad with them. It just comes down to how you execute it your own way. Um, And yeah, for me, I will read like, you know, like there's plenty of tropes where they could be either great books or they could be bad books. And the defining factor there is not necessarily the specific trope that the author has chosen, but rather like how they have written about it. So I guess that kind of segues nicely into another question, Melinda, which is, so you've got all these sort of, epic fantasy tropes that you're interested in exploring in your books. How do you think about kind of going along with sort of the standard way that those tropes are done or subverting them um, or putting your own spin on them? What's your sort of approach to that? Um, Definitely with the grimdark stuff, I was into hugely subverting the tropes. That's what that was all about. Um, This book was all about really embracing the tropes, but then putting like a slightly different spin on them. Um, like my dragons, for instance, um, are basically stone. And when they're alive, they're, <laughs> they're dragons, but when they die, they actually like turn into like a stone kind of thing. And that's like, that you know, cool. a little spin on the trope that I did. So I think another area as well is like, you have like a main character who is neuroatypical as well, which is like something that you don't necessarily see, or at least in my experience, reading epic fantasy, haven't seen that a lot. So it's cool to know that you can, even within a story that is like, very much like, you know, classical epic fantasy and stuff, you can still be putting your own spin and putting your own interests into there and everything. Yeah, definitely. Mm. And it's done really, really well too, because um, never, never does anyone say, oh, well, you know, he's, he's neuro atypical, right? Or never, there, there's no name for the way he behaves. Um, But the people react to him the same way people react, you know, to people like that in, in society. Um, and, you know, good or bad. 
So I think it's it's just unless somebody knew kind of recognize these these tendencies and character traits, right? You would just think that this is the way this character is, you know? And I've actually seen some of the reviews are like, I don't know why the character is like this and I don't like it. And other people have no idea that that's what you're doing, but they love the character. And then, of course, people who do recognize that and know people or are that way themselves love it. Which I think is awesome. Really, really nice the way you treated it. Thank you. I think you're the uh, only person we've ever had on here that all of us that are here have read your book. Oh, I haven't actually read it yet. Sorry. Oh, you have. I'm going to read it very soon. Yes. Oh, I thought you had. I'm See, going to read it very soon. That's how rare. That's how rare. <laughs> it's that big that, like, I've been reading it for two days, and I'm like, I'm only, I'm less than twenty percent of the way through it. <laughs> and that's about, and, and right where you stopped is probably as long as like my entire trilogy is. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely am. Oh, no, your, your books are pretty big as well, man. <laughs> yeah, but Believe me, I, third I'm one. working on one right now. <laughs> are you? Yeah. It is How probably about as long as Never Die because everybody keeps like when people read Never Die, they're just like. This book's been on a diet, and I think it needs to fatten up a bit more. It's it's amazing <laughs> how many times my uh, my little book gets uh, fin shamed. <laughs> eat eat a burger, Never Die. Yeah, I reckon. Have some more, like, yeah, Shinigami in there or something. Um, how long is Dragon Mage? It is about, let's see here. How, mu- how long is it, Rob? Quick. <laughs> how many, uh, in, in how the many hardbacks, words? It's like 800 and something odd pages. So. Okay. Yeah. But how many words? Pages. <laughs> that yeah, 819 impressive. pages. How many words, though? I'm sure you remember. Um, <laughs> it started off as being 270K, um, I think, after editing. 260 maybe that's a massive book still you know yeah it, it, it was big. <laughs> like the longest book i've ever written was i think it came out as 220 and it was a slog <laughs> it was it was grueling it was very grueling to write yeah. have you found that's that four, the... that's four harry potters no crap <laughs> yeah true yeah yeah four, well the first like, book is just stones, over yeah. eighty thousand, eighty four thousand words i think yeah. Seventy-seven thousand, I think. They got long. They got long afterwards. So it's they Prince did. of Fawns, though. Actually, that's quite a short one, technically. So yeah, it's about four, four Prince of Fawns as well. There you go. Does the Never um, with regards to the length, does that sort of like make it easier? Do you think that makes it easier to market or harder to market? Easier. Interesting. Um, Interesting. because it's in Kindle Unlimited, so I get paid for every page flip, and so I can actually bid higher and still make money than somebody who has a shorter book. And by bid higher, you're talking about AMS ads, ads on yeah. Amazon, right? right. Yeah. yeah. And that's that's another thing in your marketing of the book that I I was blown away by the amount of research you did and experimentation you did prior to even the release of the book, right? To know exactly what to set your budgets and bids and what your best performing keyword's gonna be so that when you hit it hard, it was gonna go. And that is just a tremendous amount of work. I just, I don't know when you sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I took a couple months off writing and just spent that time trying to get the book rolled out. And so that's one of the things I did just for days and days and days, you know, went keyword hunting. Um, it used to be a little easier. We used to have this little tool called Yassif, uh-huh. which would kind of like, you know, figure out your also bots and the also bots of your also bots and stuff like that. Just like link everything together in a big web and that's no longer functioning. So you, I kind of had to do all that manually. Um, well, so, it. Huh? And, and also your book wasn't out yet. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I had to actually start researching people's books who I thought were like mine. And then, Similar enough. Uh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. so, um, yeah, they do have other tools that will scrape for you, but they really are not very targeted. So I just did it manually. <laughs> it took I'd love a to dig into that a bit uh, more. Like, so I'd love to doing that 
into that a bit more. So your book isn't out at this stage, but you're somehow able to figure out what sort of Amazon targeting keywords to are going to be effective for it. How do you, how do you do that? Because I'd imagine that it would be hard to know for sure. Like if they're going to be effective when. Yeah. Um, how were you, how were you testing could... bids like amount to bid without having a book to actually put an ad up for? Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. I, I was testing bids on a book. I was testing bids on the pre-order is what I was doing. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm. Okay. So I put okay. the pre-order up and then I would try like different bit bids and just kind of see where my book was like on different pages and if it had the visibility I wanted it to have. That's amazing. That's really That's cool. a lot of work. And I, <laughs> I mean, it's just because it's brilliant too. I never would have even thought to do something like that. You wanted to find out basically for folks that aren't familiar, when you're using Amazon ads, AMS, have you guys talked about this? Am I repeating? I don't know. Go for it. Um, you, uh, if, if people go and search certain keywords, like if someone goes and searches never die, right? If I'm using never die as a keyword, um, when they go to the never die page, hopefully they'll see a little sponsored ad either in the list of all of them that are across the bottom or over here or in the bar up here. Um, and uh, they'll see my book on the never die page. And hopefully once they buy never die or even better, if they just skip it and don't even buy that, but go look at my ad, buy my book. Um, <laughs> uh, that's how ads work. And depending on, how much you bid, um, you'll place first in that carousel at the bottom, um, or you'll get that one on the side, or you'll get that one at the bar at the top. If you bid a little higher, you get both bottom and side. You bid a little higher, you'll get all three. Melinda was on every page <laughs> of all my books for two months in all three places, or at least a month in all three places. You go to my book page and there'd be Dragon Mage, Dragon Mage, Dragon Mage. It was awesome. I mean, I love it. What you're it, saying but, is, but she that's sold the your only way, sales. The only <laughs> way she, the only way she knew, I mean, you can just go in and bid $5, right? And you're gonna get that, but you don't wanna spend $5 if you don't need to. So what, Melinda, what I think Melinda was doing was putting in a high bid. Um, if it wasn't getting the placement she wanted, she might raise it up. If it was, she would then put it down and then put it down and put it down until it wasn't anymore and then put it back up, ratchet it back up. So she was spending the minimum amount for those three. Now, what that takes is every single day, right? once a day or several times a day, you've got to go in and see what the placements are on all your keywords. And how many did you have? 50, a hundred? More. <laughs> so you would check Maybe. for every single one of those yeah. where they were placed once a day at least, right? Yeah. Wow. And then ratchet <laughs> up and down the bid for every single one of those. Doing every See, this is genius. This is genius. But it I just had, like, it just goes to show you what more goes into being a self-published can go into being a self-published author, other than just writing your books and then trying to get them get some art for the covers <laughs> and get them made. That's a um, hell of a lot of work. And yeah, and, that is and now anyone can do this and spend a ton of money on advertising, and a ton of people do, and their books still tank right? This was the perfect storm because she was spending at that level to really get in a lot of, in front of a lot of eyes. And it's also a great book that appeals, that is appealing to a very wide range of fantasy readers. I think um, she nailed so much. Of it. I, well, I say she, yeah. I think and you the, and, nailed and the cover, so much of The it. cover makes a huge difference. It's the cover, this says, it's the title. This says exact, the title, this says exactly what this book needs to be. Now, no one, and this is, this is very common, right? 
Um, no one in the in my books, paternus. I think the word paternus is mentioned once or twice in all the books. No one ever says never die or talks about never die in never die, right? I will never no, Does anyone ever <laughs> say never die? Yeah, I've got a roll credits mo mo moment. Okay. Yes. Um, I'll have I don't know, know if anybody talks about every a single dragon one of these mage. Mortal techniques I mean, a lot of times people think, okay, this is, it's going to start out and say, the boy really wanted to be a dragon mage, right? <laughs> now that's quite common, but you don't have to do that because he is a dragon mage. I mean, he, he really is, but that doesn't mean you have to use this. So titles like descriptions don't have to fit exactly the 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 story this could this image though could be right out of the story easily um the cover of never die could be right out of the story jed's covers right out of the story mine are more iconic um they uh they aren't uh they aren't scenes exactly as described right out of none of them, in particular, the first one, um, which has the guy with the spear fighting the big buffalo demon. Yes, that happens, but I've got him outside in rubble with hmm. a cityscape in the background and bats flying around. They never fight. He never fights that thing out in a city. But it says fantasy um, fighting things, fighting big monsters, and it says urban fantasy. Uh, which is which is what I needed to say. Um, so that's those are other things to think about in the marketing, right? Yes, unless absolutely. I'm completely off, guys. Right. Well, Melinda, I'd love to just hear like, what's your yeah? Is there anything else that we're missing within sort of what we just said then, or any other things you want to add into yeah. what Dirk was discussing? I, I think the only other thing to say is well, Dragon Mage. The two big key words that I really wanted to hit right there on the cover. So yeah. that was very intentional. <laughs> um, did you do research or did you just think about that? I wanted, when people type in dragons, I want to be the first person to come up. When people typed in mage, I want to be the first person who came up. Mm -hmm. So I just combined those two words. Perfect. And why did you, yeah, like sort of, is that just because you just like knew that those words were the sort of the big epic fantasy words? No, I just, I wanted those audience. I wanted the dragon lovers and I wanted the mage lovers. So Sweet. It certainly worked. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they're big audiences as well. I mean, the, there's the whole thing of, um, you know, uh, sort of power words, as it were. So especially in things like fantasy, you get certain words which are just, they're iconic to the genre and they are what people look for. Yes. Things like dragons, people. You know, there are so many people who literally they just go onto Amazon and they will search for books about dragons. They're not so bothered about eh, whatever else is in it at that time. They're just like, I want a book about dragons. Mm. So it's it's kind of genius in that way. It's just like, yep, yeah, nail it. Anyone who wants dragons, this is it. Here you go. 800 pages of them in glorious hardback. Um, so we're oh, man, probably... I'm 100 pages in and there's no dragons. <laughs> I'm sure. Now, hold on. There was a dragon on the first page. Exactly. Ah, that, like, shit. first line in the story. Even I know that and I haven't read it yet. <laughs> it died! <laughs> ah, yeah. Well, um, yeah, so I think we'll, we'll probably, like, wrap up this episode now. But before we'll do that, um, Emil, do you want to give us a the pitch for Dragon Mage? Because we've talked about it heaps. Don't think we've actually described the blurb for it. Um, I don't know. Would you like to... Tell us a little bit about what the story is about, apart from dragons and mages, which should be enough reason for you to run out and buy it right now. I should have like a one line pitch, but I really don't. I think I did it one time and I forgot it. Um, stop it, guys. You're killing me. <laughs> um, it, it's basically about a, you know, a neuroatypical boy who is, you know, just really kind of, you know, he wants people to like him very much and he's always had a hard time with that. And he actually kind of is very doubting himself and everything else. He ends up being a dragon mage and gets a lot of wonderful friends and starts to believe in himself. And not only that, but it's his, his, basically it's the way his brain works 
that actually helps him with his magic and the whole magic system. It just really clicks just because of the way he is and the way he's wired. So awesome. All right. That is Dragon Mage. Uh, I'm going to get a copy very soon. I'm really wanting to get that hardback. It's expensive to get out in Australia, but it looks amazing. Looks like it'll be worth it. Um, I mean, over there, don't you have to sort of like, you know, I don't know, get the kangaroos to go and fetch it. Yeah, you got to fight off the wombat gangs. Um, I think that Ingram has an Australian distributor now, doesn't it? Oh, really? Yeah, I think they do. Ingram does. <coughs> Actually, no, they do. They yeah. do. I didn't realize that your book was uh, printed to Ingram. That's that's awesome. So is that hardback through Ingram Spark? Yeah. Sweet. Wow. Okay, that's great. Um, awesome. Okay, so we'll wrap up this episode now, but we will have Melinda back for another episode, um, probably a little bit shorter than this one, in might be next week, might be a few weeks after. Not sure how the magic scheduling is going to work for this. Um, so thank you, everybody, for listening. Go check out Dragon Mage, and we will see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Sorry for being late. <laughs> and as we end this episode, thank you to our special high-tier Patreon, Daniel Henderson.